Well, hello, everyone, and, and welcome. Um, it's wonderful to see everyone here today, and uh, delighted uh, that, uh, again, uh, there's been such a, a splendid turnout. Um, I know that not everybody uh, in this room was able to make it to uh, Dr. Connor's lecture last night. We're not going to make any assumptions about that. Um, this is very much um, its own event. Uh, but allow me to welcome you and to welcome you on behalf of the Department of Classics and our, our, our dear friends at the Howenstein Center for Presidential Studies. Uh, this is co-sponsored uh, by Howenstein and by the Department of Classics with the generous support of Provost Gail Davis. And we're so pleased and uh, I, I hope you'll uh, join me in welcoming uh, Dr. W. Robert, he prefers to be known as Bob, Bob Connor. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, thank you so much, Bob, for your talk last night. It was such a wonderful occasion. Thank and, you for having me. Well, absolutely. So Good please. Good to meet you. Uh, we've already, Bob, Bob has already sung for his supper uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, he, uh, he regaled us uh, with so much rich information about antiquity and uh, the problem of anticipating the unexpected um, that um, we're going to give him something of a break. He's certainly not going to uh, recapitulate his speech all over again uh, today. Um, instead, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be inviting the three other distinguished uh, members of the panel, the respondents, to offer their own perspectives on some of the questions that Bob raised in his talk last night, and I'll attempt to do my best to summarize some of those things uh, in a moment here. But first of all, let me introduce the other respondents on the panel. First of all, Professor Paul Isley. He is the chair of the Economics Department in the Simon College of Business here at Grand Valley State University. And thank you so much for attending. Uh, to his left is Professor Polly Divin, Professor of Political Science, uh, Director of the International Relations Program here at Grand Valley State University. Thank you so much. <laughs> and at the, uh, the far left, uh, to my left on the uh, dais here is Professor Jonathan White, Professor of Multidisciplinary Studies, uh, now at the Meyer Honors College, uh, an expert in many fields. I, I'm astonished at all of the, all of the things uh, that Professor White knows, but in particular, uh, an expert on counterterrorism and home, homeland security. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I do want to open this up, uh, and I do want, uh, especially once the respondents have had an opportunity to uh, uh, make their responses, uh, to invite participation and questions from the audience. And so we will uh, be wrapping up uh, quite promptly at 1.50. I know that people have classes at 2 o'clock to do. It's a limited amount of time. We want to make the most out of it. But in particular, please be, those of you who were at the lecture last time, those of you who hear things today, that provoke you and stimulate you or that you really want to dig down and develop the answers to, uh, get ready because I'm going to hopefully uh, step down at some point uh, uh, this afternoon and, and invite some questions and some participation for the audience. This is deliberately informal. Uh, I'm the only one behind a podium. I'm going to get away from the podium in one minute and then uh, we'll proceed from there. But Bob, Tell me if I'm going to do justice to this or not. As I listened to your talk last night, it seems to me that there were five, five things that, that I proposed that we isolate from, from the many things that you had to say and see if I've, I've done anything approaching justice to, to what you invited us to think about last night. The first thing is that it seems to me you invited us to consider the possibility that our approaches to thinking about risk, to thinking about uncertainty, to thinking about um, the unpredictable are as historically contingent, as culturally embedded, and potentially as ridiculous and laughable to someone who is outside of our historical moment and outside of our cultural frame as some of the practices of the ancients that you talked about last night. Divination, observing the flights of birds, 
consulting an oracle in a temple, right? We look at those and we say, how could those people have thought that this was an efficacious way of determining what the future is? You invited us to consider the possibility. In fact, you interviewed the Pythia, the priestess of Delphi last night. And you say, and you try to imagine whether or not the ancients would look at some of the ways in which we model risk and say exactly the same thing. So that's the first point. To what extent are we, to some extent, um, confined by our own historical and cultural frames in terms of approaching some of these questions? Um, the second thing, uh, and the third thing, and the fourth thing are what you characterized as three takeaways that you said could be uh, uh, applied to several different situations involving leadership, involving risk, involving prediction. And that anybody who's a decision maker or anybody who's thinking about the future needs to think about. The first one of these was what you called blindsidedness. Okay, the, the, the vulnerability to being blindsided by events. And how many times have we heard that expression over the last couple of years? Um, I'm going to suggest, I don't know if you use this word particularly, Bob, but I'm going to suggest that maybe another way of putting that is the dangers of specialization or the, narrowest, the narrowness of vision that comes when one relies upon increasingly narrowly uh, drawn uh, areas of, of expertise. Okay, so the, the problem of specialization. Um, the second thing that you mentioned was uh, the danger of unintended consequences. That is to say, you know, our ability to be continually surprised by things we hadn't foreseen that were perhaps incapable of being foreseen uh, and, and, and then responding to it. And the third thing that you mentioned under that heading was the problem of time frames, the problem that we, we often make decisions on the basis of limited time, limited evidence, the pressure of circumstances. We often make predictions based upon very limited time frames. We expect things to finish much more readily than they sometimes do, and that we can we can endanger ourselves, we can, we, can, we can certainly magnify the risks that come from blindsidedness and that come from, um, uh, that come from unintended consequences as time extends, right? That, that multiplies those dangers. All right, so those are the three t key takeaways that, that you introduced at your lecture tonight. And that's the second, third, and the fourth of the five things I'm going to tell you about, all of which is a way of telling you I'm about to sit down and stop talking to you. The fifth thing is that you suggested that the response or the solution or the, a way of, if not resolving this dilemma, but addressing constructively this dilemma we have lies not in a top ten list of easily digested you know, rules or maxims or lessons from history. You, resi you resisted the idea of distilling a series of, of, uh, of lessons from history that we could all walk away from your talk last night and feel confident about. And instead you suggested that what we have instead is the ability to combat blindsidedness, to combat all of these other kinds of things by looking carefully and critically, taking a wide view considering the broadest possible perspectives, uh, being critical, being aware of our own cultural and historical blindnesses, all of those things, um, the outcome of which is much of what we talk about when we talk about liberal education and what liberal education is for at this university and other places. So is, have I done reasonable justice to these things? Is there anything I've left so out? So much shorter, clearer, <laughs> and better than my talk. Yes, yes, thank you. Well, I, I'm not sure that I would go that far, but if you'll accept that as a, 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 provi a provisional basis upon which to proceed, what I'd like to do is I'd like to, to, to invite each of the respondents to, to respond both to Bob's talk, uh, if I've left anything out that you particularly want to bring to the, uh, to the conversation from last night, folks, please feel free to do so. But Professor Isley, please let us know what, let us know what your, your field can contribute to the discussion. Okay, so we're economics. Um, and economics, uh, economists are often asked to try and predict the future in order to decrease risk. Um, which is sort of humorous. We often tell each other that we predict only because we're asked to. Um, you know, there's a lot, of in, a lot of problems with this because we're only able to see the future based on the past. Um, so the other way we like to describe it is it's like driving down the road at 90 miles an hour using only your rearview mirror. 
you tend to miss right corners. And in fact, when we look at uh, the way we do these types of things, we can see that the air that exists when the economy takes a right uh, corner with forecasts is twice as big as it is when we don't take a right-hand corner. Um, so the trick starts to be to try to anticipate how you're going to deal with the right-hand corner that you can't predict. Um, and with that, there are lots of tools. Yeah, so oh. else see? see Mm-hmm. No, you don't want to see my face. <laughs> All right, can you see my pretty face now? <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, so on that level, we, I think there's a large level of agreement between what was being stated last night and how we view things. Um, what we've seen over the last decade in, in economics is a desire to as we try to deal with deeper and deeper and deeper problems, wider problems, uh, we have to spend more and more time looking at um, how high these things are, right? Mm -hmm. Because it will cause problems. We have to spend more and more time looking at what other fields are talking about. Um, and economists, by their very nature at this point, have to become experts on all sorts of different things, whether it be the weather, whether it be uh, nuclear, uh, processes, whether it be uh, aerodynamics of airplanes, and all of those things uh, we've had to become experts on um, and integrate with experts on. So I think broadening out our base uh, fits very well as well. So, you know, other than the fact that I still see a huge value in this, in the act of actually trying to understand why things are happening, um, you know, I'm not uh, here to say that economists predict the future, nor do we want to. That would take the fun out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Professor Divin. One way I deal with risk is by preparing notes. So <laughs> I believe in being prepared. Um, I feel like you have to have a little sympathy for my task because I was invited to give, to listen to a talk given by a senior scholar with impeccable credentials. He went to two of the same schools I did, so. Um, we know he's very smart. Uh, and then to hear him advocate looking to history to understand modern problems, which of course is not really very controversial. I think everybody agrees with that. Then my dean stands up and throws him a total softball and asks him, well then what's the value of liberal education in this context? And he says, well there's a great value in liberal education and everybody agrees with that. And then I'm supposed to find fault, you see. So I feel like I'm in a little bit of a, a need for sympathy here mode. Okay. Still, I've been asked to provide some comments, and I'm going to do that. I do have two, two important points that I want to make that I think differ pretty strongly with what um, Bob Connor suggested last night. One, is history written in surprises? If we write it that way, it is. We can also write history about a series of very well-predicted events, about one boring event after another. And that's the problem with history, really. There are a variety of ways to tell the same story. Uh, in his talk, Professor Connor chose to highlight the surprises of history, but I think he could have told about other events that were very well anticipated in history. So one of the main pre, pre uh, well, one of the things he said first last night was you have to understand that there's been a lot of surprises, but there are no always surprises, and some things are not as surprising as he led us to believe. For example, we know, um, we know a lot in political science about voting patterns among certain groups of people, African Americans, evangelicals. We can kind of predict what they're going to do in elections. We know President Bush was going to invade Iraq long before he did, and many of us, including myself, knew that if he did, it would be a very long war. This wasn't a, really a surprise, so I think that that's something we have to keep in mind. Um, we have to recognize that history has surprises, but also history has very predictable events. And if you pick to talk about the surprise events, that's what we in social science call selection bias, <laughs> right? Some of you who are students who study social sciences should know that if you just talk about surprises, you're giving a biased sample. Okay, so there may be more times when we've got it right than he acknowledged, including democracy riots in Egypt that didn't come out of nowhere, but we know that, for example, rising food prices often leads to rioting, and that happened. 9-11 didn't come out of nowhere. The likelihood of this event was highlighted in the president's daily intelligence briefing a month before the event, right? We do have a problem here with raw intelligence, so much raw intelligence that we don't know what's the finished intelligence, what to pay attention to. But we know that it said in his daily briefing that there could be attacks by Al Qaeda, hijacking airplanes and flying them into buildings a month before it occurred. So I guess I just want to take issue first with the idea that there's uh, surprises as much as he suggests. 
storing spent nuclear fuel rods in pools at the sites of nuclear weapons uh, reactors as we have in Japan. That's something that Congress advised against 30 years ago in the United States. Once again, I mean, there are decisions and there are plans and then there's implementation. So events are nowhere near as unpredictable as the speaker suggests and history can be told as a series of boring, predictable events depending on how you tell it. Second point, okay, that was one. <laughs> Importance of teaching our students multiple methodologies. Now, I'm not a barefoot empiricist or raw positivist, but I do believe that we have to have different methods of doing inquiry and we can't put our blinders on and only think about certain methods. And I think it's kind of ironic that Professor Connor talked about you know, blindsidedness and then sort of omitted all the statistical and data analysis out there or kind of put it aside as, you know, oh, errors of correlation and causation. I mean, obviously, if we want to be broad-minded and consider all sorts of analysis, then we have to look beyond history and look at all kinds of ways of looking at the same problems. The use of empirical methods, including data analysis and statistical modeling, is not a foolhardy way to look for answers to some really important current issues. If you want to avoid lung cancer, the data tell you to quit smoking. And to be honest, I'm taking my risk by quitting smoking, not by listening to some sort of, you know, someone throwing sticks or, or, or conjuring the dead or something. Do you know what I mean? I, he was talking about the foolhardiness last night of using um, data as almost akin to the foolhardiness of some of the methods used by the ancients. Okay. Poli-Sci and I are students, and I think a lot of you know that there's a big difference between correlation and causation. They better know that. Um, I'm not in favor of dismissing decades of good statistical analysis because some people don't know the difference between correlation and causation. I think we need to educate people about the difference mm -hmm. between correlation and causation. Many students come to universities without a clear understanding of how to read and interpret data. Sometimes they've been taught to distrust numbers. A lot of students come and they've already learned to hate statistics or distrust numbers. Mm -hmm. And it's our job at a university to teach them history, but also to teach them how to read data with a critical eye, how to use data well, when to believe it, when to be skeptical of it, right? I would argue we need to teach history, but we also need to teach critical analysis. In my um, poli-sci capstone class, we read a book a little while ago called um, War is a Force, It Gives Us Meaning. It's a book by Chris Hedges. Mm -hmm. And it's a book that has important theories and ideas in it, but a lot of unsubstantiated armchair theorizing based on personal experiences. And sometimes he blends what I call his evidence, <laughs> loosely said, um, from great works of the classical past. He cites a little bit about Eros and Thanatos and, and he has the Odyssey in there. Um, but sometimes I think these things can be used in a mistaken way to really uh, endanger the quality of the text. Hedges includes in his book all sorts of bold statements about sex drive of soldiers, about their addiction to battle, and his experience his experiences seem to vindicate that. He uses his own anecdotal evidence to say this is what, this is what happened to me. But I think that the students and I, as we read this book, concluded that a lot of assertions are troubling and they're offensive to people and they need to be tested empirically. People need to do studies about these things, not just say, well, we saw it in the ancient Greece and we saw it among some, I saw it among my five friends in, in, in the former Yugoslavia and therefore it's true. I mean, that's dangerous in my way of thinking. So, um, uh, I would just say that uh, there's a big difference between necromancy and the Correlates of War project. There's a big difference between sort of listening to Brian Prophets and listening to the War Values, World Values Survey. And we can't really lump them together, I don't think, um, and just look to Thucydides for answers. Thucydides is a, you know, a brilliant work of, of, of uh, history, but it's not uh, the be-all and end-all. So I encourage people to investigate. Um, multiple modes of inquiry, and I think our job at this university is to encourage people to not be biased against any form of, of inquiry. Um, many people are using, um, some students come to our, our school, in my est estimation, um, using anecdotal evidence to support pre-existing biases. You know, oh, I had an aunt who got a cold from eating too much peanut butter, so I think we shouldn't eat peanut butter. You know, this kind of way of thinking about the world, which is really harmful and dangerous and leads us to have biases against people and, and a solid inquiry. So um, I think introducing a hearty respect for data and its limits is a vital part of a liberal arts education. And that's how I want to end. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Divin. And uh, Professor White, please. Thank you. Uh, I was in class last night, so I really appreciated the summary. <laughs> uh, and I, I knew that that was going to be happening today. But I found myself, in terms of the summary, being very much in agreement with what I heard, although uh, and maybe this is the, 
the aspect of being a person who likes to bring different sides together, um, I like what Professor Divin is saying too, because I think it is a matter of perspective and how information is used. For example, 9-11. Um, I can't go into all of the details, but I can tell you during the summer of 2001 when a particular defense company was asking for a, for a government client to have a ta an attack planned on the United States, the attack that was uh, developed was a suicide attack on the World Trade Center in New York. Uh, and the reason that could be developed is because there is a difference, and I think this reconciles the two opinions, there's a difference between real-time intelligence and background intelligence. Walmart, who has the, the, the company that has the best intelligence operation in the United States, operates like this with probabilities. They take basic background and then the data and specific behavior, blend it together and work on probabilities. We think this will happen. The blind side comes when we're not open to failure or not open to the complete surprise. Um, let me illustrate that with three quick points and then we'll, we'll get to the panel and, and questions. Back to the 9-11, uh, how did we know something like that was going to happen? Well, with a terrorist movement, if you study the specific movement, one of the things that uh, data indicate about terrorist movements is most terrorist groups learn incrementally. They take the past, come to a particular operational level, operate at that level until they learn a new level, then move up to it. If you deconstruct where they are, you can tell with some reasonable probability what they're going to do next. What you can't tell is exactly how they're going to do it or where they're going to do it. That's background intelligence, getting this is what we think we're going, they're going to do next. Real-time intelligence is then turning it over to a, a group of very broad thinkers who look at possibilities with that background uh, information, trying to get real-time information coming in. The second analysis comes with the Vietnam War. We were a country in the 1960s, was progressing, we were positivistic, we were mathematical, uh, we believed in the American dream, early to bed, early to rise, work like heck and advertise, and everything was going to come out <laughs> right, and lo and behold, we get involved in a conflict in Vietnam. We bring in our best managers, and they calculate, and I'm being very simple now, but I'm painting big pictures in history. If you drop this many bombs for this period of time, and destroy this many people and this many targets, the North Vietnamese should surrender within this time frame. That is opening yourself to being blindsided because you're not considering all the possibilities. When we look to the run-up of op Operation Iraqi Freedom, which a lot of us were very concerned about for a variety of unintended consequences that we still haven't paid yet, um, we had a mentality that said, War had changed forever, technology had changed it, and if we just do this, we will win the war in this many days. Tommy Franks, who took over Central Command, was pressured by the Secretary of Defense to reduce, 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 and follow that particular pattern, almost repeating uh, a pattern that we saw in Vietnam. When generals were irritated, when Eric Shinsaki, uh, Shinsaki uh, raised an objective, uh, objection, he lost his job as chief of staff. The secretary of the army who supported General Shinsaki was moved aside. There was no opposition. Well, and the first three weeks of the war went just like we planned it. We weren't blindsided at all. And we won in Iraq, it got out of there in three, three weeks, and oil paid for it all, right? <laughs> well. There were other issues, and that is, it's necessary to be open to those other issues. The last thing I will say is, uh, not long ago, we had hostages being held in Tehran. We uh, charged our armed forces, Delta Force in particular, to go in and rescue those armed forces. And they practiced it and looked for everything that could go wrong. But they didn't plan for enough stuff to go wrong. For example, when you operate in the desert, you need three times as many helicopters as you do if you're gonna operate uh, in a temperate environment. 
Uh, you have to plan, if you, if you don't know the story, a whole busload of Iranians came through uh, a place called the Hyde site, and nobody was prepared for them. Uh, you have to plan for that. I recall listening to one uh, general who said, in operations like this, you, you have to know that things are going to go wrong. In fact, in military history, if you look uh, at battles, if you get 51% right, you are probably going to win because there is mistake after mistake after mistake. And you need to be open to everything is going to fall apart. Helmut von Moltke, the elder, not the commander in World War uh, I, but the, the founder of the great German general staff said, as soon as the first is fired, your plan goes out the window because everything starts changing. So you're working with probabilities. That's what I would say. And very quickly, I would like to say uh, thanks to the Howenstein Center. They are so critical. Colonel Howenstein, so critical to Grand Valley State University. And uh, as a person who comes from law enforcement and a professional background, I would like to say the Department of Classics anchors us. So thank you very much for having this uh, conversation today. Well, thank you very much. I, I appreciate that a great deal. And, and thank you to, to each of the, the three respondents. I mean, I think very short contributions and, and, and a, a very daunting task for everybody to not only respond to uh, uh, the conversation last night, but also to encapsulate um, so wonderfully the different perspectives and the, and the very well-reasoned responses that you have. I, a wonderful basis now for the, the remainder of our time. Um, I'd like to invite Dr. Connor to, uh, to uh, respond to the respondents, if you would like. Yeah, this is a very rich set of responses, and um, I appreciate them both uh, people who found things to agree with and people who found things to disagree with in, in, in the talk. I, I find this very, very stimulating. I'm not trying to go down uh, the list, except uh, to, instead I'd like to make just kind of one observation. Uh, I think in a university, the crucial issue for us uh, is the educational one. I mean, how do these difficult problems that we're confronting in economics and international relations and terrorism and so on, how do we work in a university for the next generation of people who are going to have to struggle with these and other unforeseen uh, problems? Um, certainly the quantitative approaches um, are extremely important. And I don't want to be misunderstood. Um, I get a certain amount of flack, actually, in, uh, in some of the work I do by people who think I'm excessively quantitative uh, in, in things I do. What does seem to emerge out of the comments here is the perpetual necessity of trying to contextualize what we're learning within our different specializations particular, and not least of uh, the, the ones that come out of quantitative analysis of data. Uh, and I think it's extremely important educational point to say, look, we gotta learn how to do this. I mean, we, we've gotta understand statistical analysis. I'm totally in agreement with that. And in understanding it, we have to recognize limits. We have to recognize the importance of formulating the right questions when we start the statistical analysis. And we have to, at the, uh, as, the, uh, as the data emerges, think, wait a minute, just how full an, uh, an answer is this? What are the other questions that need, uh, need to be done? So it's constant process of broadening out. I think we can see that pretty clearly uh, in uh, various kinds of quantitative analyses. But I think it applies also to those of us who work in uh, more literary-based, uh, documentary-based uh, historical analyses. We've got a similar set of questions. We've got to figure out to what extent this material, uh, what are the limits of knowledge that come out of it, what are the applications of it, and how in each case do we avoid this blindsiding, which one way or the other has affected us so often in our society, and I think will probably continue to um, affect us as we go into a very uncertain world. So uh, I'm trying to say I think there's a lot of agreement among us, but what I'd really like to do is um, to hear what the audience is thinking. Well, that's, that's a wonderful segue then uh, to what I, what I warned you about, which was the, uh, 
what I encouraged you about, which is the audience participation segment of this. Bunch of rich responses here, clearly uh, lots of things to be said, um, lots of key issues, people who've thought long and hard, not only about uh, what they know, but about how they know it. And uh, I'm gonna step down from the podium now, and uh, I'm going to invite all of you to pose a question. Please, let me walk over just so that we can all hear what's being said. Thank you. Um, my name is Petra Al Sufing. Um, I'm an intern with the Hans Stein Center, and I just want to point out I'm a political science and history student. Um, and the reason um, that I decided to make that decision um, is because I realized each um, each discipline has its limits. Um, and I, I it's it's a little bit more of a comment than a question. I I realize that. Um, I think if we just look at um, events or what's going on in the world, especially today where everything or almost everything is in a way interconnected, um, then we get to a point where we ask, where do we start in history? At what point do we start in history? Um, who do we leave out and what do we leave out from the story? Um, if we just look at um, the social sciences and the data and things like that, then, um, uh, then we're missing ba the background story of what happened. Um, so I think that's the value of having a liberal education, is you, uh, you need to be specialized in a certain discipline, in a certain area, but at the same time, expose yourself to as many opportunities and many backgrounds as possible, um, so you could look at things from a critical point of view. Um, so I think that's, I think um, looking at an issue or an event um, one way is very limiting. Um, and I think some things are surprising, but I would agree with Professor Divin that a lot of things are not really as surprising as we think they are. And if we um, decide to pick a period of time in history, then we are putting self, our, ourselves in a situation to be surprised. So I just think that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I'll, I'll invite the panel to to respond to that comment. But uh, I'm just I'm curious myself. Uh, the students in the room. I'll take a little straw poll here. How many of you are double majors or have a major and a minor in, in different fields? Can you, would you just a quick show of hands? I mean, I think that's, that's very interesting. Yeah. I think it's very interesting that, um, and it's something that, that I think we notice as faculty. I mean, the idea, and of course not all of you are, are, are necessarily choosing uh, uh, widely varying fields at all, but the, I think you guys do seem to, to get this idea, which is that having multiple competencies, taking the opportunity to demonstrate that you can succeed in different disciplines, you know, it's certainly something that I perceive as a faculty member here, and, you know, I, I applaud you for it. It's, it's, I admire your ambition. Uh, who who, uh, who well, has let me, let me just Dr. Connor. Thank the, uh, the, the questioner and uh, also for your quick um, quantitative uh, study of the <laughs> audience here, uh, <laughs> polling of them. Uh, I had, um, a much smaller sample over lunch. Uh, I met with a half dozen students, and um, I think all the six happened to be double or sometimes triple majors or, or minors. Uh, surprised me to see that number, which, uh, and then of course, probably a better sample that we just saw right, right now. Uh, I think that's terrific. I think it's really important, um, and I, I guess the, the residual question I have, I, I, really think this ought to be encouraged and uh, rewarded in, in so far as one can. But the residual question is whether, in, where, whether there are areas of exclusion uh, when we contextualize economic uh, phenomena, when we look at international relations, when we look at uh, terrorism, are uh, there are areas that we have tended to underweight as we attempt to make our assessments of what's likely to come next. And, wouldn't mind. I'd like to just toss that that question to my fellow panelists. Absolutely, I think that's a, a very rich theme that we've opened up with this this comment and this question from the audience. Who would who would like to who would like to take the 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 podium next, the the microphone next, mm -hmm. Professor Isley? Sure. Um, well, just just noting, I was a double major. I have both a physics and an econ undergraduate. So just to go there. Um, <laughs> Um, and believe it or not, they're the same thing, but that's a whole other topic. 
Um, you know, the key in any modeling science is to know what you've underweighted and to know the dangers that occur when you do that. Um, when we look at economics as economists, it's a lot different than the economists that you see on TV who um, are really politicians or media whores. Um, you know, it's, it's really, we have to spend our time uh, understanding many different models of the economy and then trying to determine where, where the economy is at, which, which model might work the best under these conditions. And to do that, you have to understand the weaknesses of each model. Um, I like to remind people a model is not reality. It's a model. It's a simplification. It, by necessity, it's a simplification. And some models are good at one thing, some are at the other. And the key is not to use the wrong model. Um, and that's the hard part. And that only comes with lots and lots and lots and lots of doing it. Um, and then you still get it wrong. But, uh, but the more you do it, the more you don't make that type of mistake. And so for me, that's where I'm at. I mean, Did I answer your question? Yeah, that's okay. very helpful. Yeah. I, I'll invite, invite the other response to respond if you care to do so. I don't remember the question. The question was, what do we, what is it that we underweight or what, uh, what is, to the extent that we do see a large number of students these days uh, choosing more than one major, trying to kind of square the circle between the danger of specialization and what have you, what are the things that, in your experience, drop out of, out of those choices or drop out of the kinds of analyses or the kind of multi-variable, multi-perspective kinds of things that, that we're talking about today? Where should we go or where could we go? It strikes me that one of the things that's coming out of this conversation is the, just the problem of generalization itself, mm -hmm. right? And that's a problem whether you have too little data which is the problem that classicists have, or potentially too much data, which I think, um, you know, in some cases, uh, perhaps uh, more qual uh, quantitatively oriented or, or more presidents, uh, not presidents, uh, uh, presentist oriented uh, studies do. And of course, then the, the time stream or the difference between, you know, real time data and background data that you were talking about. Um, we can also move to, I'd like to just please. say one yes. thing, and that is that I think oftentimes what, what students get out of having exposure to two disciplines, as Petra said, is to have you know, a really different level of inquiry and a little skept healthy skepticism for the other discipline, because one discipline tends to inculcate you into what that discipline does. Um, unfortunately, I think often students who do double major here, and we could do a different kind of poll, and we probably won't, but uh, is that they, dis they, they major in areas that are often too close to one another. Yeah. I mean, there's not much value, in my mind, in being a poli sci and IR major, and yet students will do that. Or classics and, and, and history. They're too close, sorry. But, you know, I mean, I think you need to get away and look at different areas, and that's, that's yet something I think that, that is a whole different area altogether. And I think that maybe that's where our weakness comes, is that people don't really try to really branch out. One of the things that I, th I think, and I, w I was kicking this around this morning um, with uh, Alcibiades and the Peloponnesian War, it's just because of the nature of, of Bob's discipline. Uh, if you don't know the story, he leads an expedition to Sicily, and it, it falls apart, and the Athenians are mad. They're after him. The Athenians aren't very nice to generals who fail. So he shifts sides and go over to the Spartans. Spartans don't really, well, a lot of the Spartans don't really trust him, and he loses, loses his sponsor. So he goes to the Persians. The Athenians close their minds. They want him back because they think he can work magic. Uh, and he tells them, I'm in with the Persians. Well, the Persians, eh, they weren't so sure about Alcibiades because he kept changing sides. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, the Athenian decision makers end up going with their prejudices and not opening themselves to that blind side, not opening themselves to look for the one that's coming at you that you don't even think is there. And uh, they get a couple of successes and then Alcibiades fades from the picture again, uh, going to his own side where he was probably, uh, where that was the place he probably was in the first invasion of Sicily. Um, lessons there, and if you happen to be, say, in, uh, an agency centrally located in Langley, Virginia, and you've been told to find out about weapons of mass destruction in, say, some Middle Eastern country, and you listen to one source, like Alcibiades, mm -hmm. 
you might be getting the wrong view and not being prepared for what's coming on the other side. Well, uh, po politicians and media whores were invoked in a different context. <laughs> there we go. It just comes to mind when, when Alcibiades is invoked. I think we have time for at least one more question. Um, as I look, please, please, let me come to you. Excuse me. Alrighty. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, my name is Dan. I'm a cell molecular biology major, but my uh, question is to the initial uh, responses to uh, Dr. Connor. Um, uh, the whole issue of like background intelligence versus real-time intelligence and the difference between telling history as if it were a bunch of surprises versus telling history as if it was a bunch of planned out events. Um, for the one side, uh, for Dr. Connor's side, uh, how can we not prove that it's, say, use a psycho psychological term, how is it not hindsight bias that after it happens, how do we prove that we already didn't think, oh, we saw this coming? Um, uh, and for the other side, uh, this is <laughs> tying together uh, chemistry with Plato. Um, <laughs> but uh, Plato, we, I just learned today and <laughs> through reading, uh, uh, if we study like a city, we can uh, better understand an individual. Um, I'm going to take that in reverse for this, with the chemistry term, uh, with spontaneity. If we know ice melts under certain conditions, um, also, then we know things are going to happen under certain conditions, and we know that if things are going to happen, how can we not predict them? Thank yeah. you. Wonderful question. Wonderful question. Hindsight bias. I mean, that that I think uh, that th that I think throws up uh, uh, the question uh, wide open for us. Uh, well, let me take a very Dr. Connor. Very quick whack at it. It's a very rich, good question. Yep. Uh, we could spend a lot of time uh, teasing it out. I think there's. Uh, I want to respond to it uh, as a practicing historian, uh, and there are lots of other ways to respond to that question. But I think when you're a historian and you're looking at a complex phenomenon, a, a war, let's, uh, let's say, or the career of Alcibiades, so let's take that. What you try to do is you, you try to find a causal chain that makes sense out of it. And guess what? You know, we're pretty good at that. Um, <laughs> we can find them. Uh, and it's, in fact, I think a very useful uh, enterprise to do that. But when you're living history, it seems to me what you're constantly coming up with is surprises and then asking yourself, hey, wait a minute, what went wrong? Why didn't I, why didn't I see that? Why wasn't I clear? Maybe there was some intelligence about it. Why did I undervalue it? Um, uh, you ask a very, very different set of questions. Uh, what I was trying to do was kind of fun, I, I found kind of fun trying to you know, take that perspective of living history and use that as a way of reading a historical text. That's what uh, I was trying to do last night on the Thucydides work. But it seems to me there are lots of other ways in which one can uh, deal with your question. And particularly, we got an intelligence expert here at the far end of the panel. It would be fun to see how he reacts. <laughs> well, that looks like a way of passing the baton. <laughs> <laughs> Professor White? Oh, and I'm sitting on the far left. I, guys on my team won't believe this. Um, <laughs> it's tough to have a foot in both worlds. You go out with your government team, and, and they think, oh, you're, you're wild. You come back to the university, oh, we're afraid of you. and You just can't win, but it's a lot of fun. Um, I like the idea of the original question, uh, approaching it from another angle, and that is a sense of mystery. Uh, human beings like to orient themselves and then define that orientation and pour concrete on it and say, this is what we're going to believe. But we come to a point where uh, that world is eventually going to be shattered because there is so much more to know. There, is so, there are so many more places where we are going and life is going to be shattered. And you, at some point, you make Kierkegaard's 
wild inferential leap of faith and say, this is the place I'm going to land next. I think that has a lot to do with intelligence uh, and, and uh, predicting violent behavior or the current trend, uh, radicalization. Oh, radicalization is just a social process. People behave in certain, in certain manners if they're being radicalized. And you can observe those matters. Now, they may be being radicalized uh, to do a Columbine. They may be going into some jihadist movement. Or they might be making bad decisions about drugs or gangs. But that's a matter. Where they're going, if you see erratic behavior, then you can use some type of intervention. Always open, though, to the, it's a mystery. Because every model you have is as good as your last decision. Uh, and it's going to fall apart. Professor Isley? Well, I was just going to note, uh, having a foot both in the social sciences and the physical sciences, that one of the big problems for the social scientists are that we have no constants. Uh, when you're dealing with chemistry or with physics, you have constants. And therefore, when you throw them into equations, you have some place to start. And you know that they're there. The gravitational constant, it doesn't change or at least not in ways that matter to the things we're calculating. When I do that in social sciences, I now have to believe or at least have some inference as to how an, a person is going to behave. Um, and I can't tell you exactly that each person's going to behave the same way, which is why we end up in much more probabilistic type of viewpoint. And that's why we end up with some surprises on the tails if we choose to ignore the tails. Um, that's where the difference is there. I mean, it is the human subject in some sense, isn't it, that we're all talking about in some ways. It's certainly a subject that Thucydides was very interested in. What is it that makes people tick? How do they tend to respond? And that, that speaks to probability and everything else. Professor Divin, I'm looking at the clock. No, I was yeah. just going to say, one of the things that I think is most interesting in this kind of inquiry is that humans tend to look for information to verify their pre-existing biases. I think we can all agree on that, right? So if you are tending to want to go to Grand Valley, and then you come to Grand Valley, you look for reasons to come here, right? I mean, this is just happens a million times a day, you know, why you justify having food you don't need, or why you justify, you know, answering a, a question though you, you, you don't want to answer it. Or when you're doing your research, why you accept certain data or certain scholars uh, that, that verifies your pre-existing bias. And that's what we have to try to overcome. I mean, this is the big problem in, in, in human inquiry is to try to overcome that. In foreign policy, this is, becomes a problem when foreign policy issues get to a higher level and the number of advisors is limited. You know, we, we, this bias introduces all the time. I mean, we had this with, you know, Lyndon Johnson in Vietnam only surrounded himself with people who thought like he did. And I think this happened with Bush in, in Iraq, too. He had, you know, the five people in the room who kept telling him he's right about this. And I, I mean, this is a really, uh, you know, a very, very serious problem. And it, it's very hard to overcome it. My concern is that I think in some ways, at least for me, if I'm trying to overcome my pre-existing biases to see things one way, for me, it's easier to do that when I'm faced, smack in the face, with numbers that contradict me. It's not so easy for me to do that when I'm reading a historical text. <laughs> That's just my bias, I guess. <laughs> They're very different kinds of mirrors, aren't they? Yeah. Um, if we want to put it that way. Um, this is, and we've got a few minutes left, uh, this, is, this is the fastest 50 minutes I think I've ever been in, and I know my, the students who take classes from me know that 50 minutes can seem like an awfully long time. <laughs> um, but um, I, I think we owe it to Dr. Connor to invite him to uh, reflect upon uh, the very rich uh, discussion we've had today and to leave us with any parting thoughts that you, you might like to have before we, before we wrap things up. I don't think I have any final wisdom except uh, to, to say uh, thanks to the to the panelists for reacting honestly and thoughtfully to uh, what I was saying and to a much wider set of issues that I think we're all concerned with, we're all trying to make uh, sense out of. And I, I really want to thank uh, you, Chuck, and, uh, and, and Grand Valley for having me out. It's been a terrific experience over the last few days. Um, seeing this university in operation, and in particular seeing the kind of intellectual engagement that goes on with uh, a wide range of issues. The medium started out there with, uh, with Plato. They uh, ripple right through to physics, chemistry, economics, and a lot of other fields. 
uh, to real life experience, I got a sense of a vitality in this community. I, I hope I'm reading it right, and <laughs> I just hope that you will find every way you can to sustain it. It's so important for us in the future. Thank well, you. And thank you, Bob. We're, we're very grateful. Please, yes.